Okay, let's talk about light and telescopes. Today, we are going to discuss first the nature of light and look at um, the different wavelengths of light that we can study through the electromagnetic spectrum. We'll talk about the visible spectrum specifically and then look at the Doppler effect. As we move forward, we'll look at refraction and reflection uh, and those principles and how we use those to build upon telescopes. We'll look at some observatories here on Earth and um, some of these space telescopes, uh, the observatories in orbit. So here we go. Let's begin with the nature of light. So first off, uh, there is a speed limit to the universe, and that is the speed of light, 186,000 miles per second. Um, light behaves like a wave or a photon, so it's kind of a, got a particle duality uh, particle wave duality there, uh, where a photon being like an energy bullet uh, passing through space, we can look at light in that manner, or as in a wave, uh, light carries wave characteristics, including uh, kind of a uh, crest and a trough with wavelength in between. Um, we also note that light, um, that wavelength of light is actually electromagnetic in nature, that um, when it's generated, uh, whether it be from an electron moving from a higher to lower level or uh, through nuclear fusion in the center of a star, uh, when energy is produced, it actually uh, disturbs space with an electric field, and that electric field actually propagates a magnetic field in a uh, perpendicular direction. And magnetic fields naturally propagate electric fields. And so it's kind of a self-propagating wave as it uh, rolls through space with its wave characteristics um, indicative of the energy level uh, of the uh, original generation. So uh, it's pretty neat uh, in how this all works. Light actually can be split into different wavelengths using a prism. So a prism will take um, all the incoming light and split it into its different wavelengths for us to study. And um, the study of different light wavelengths uh, as split up by a spectrum in their different uh, parts of the spectrum is called spectroscopy. Uh, so spectroscopy is very useful when we study the light from stars because we can gather lots of information like what the star is made of, its color, and therefore then its temperature and its energy output, etc. So it's uh, very, very useful information. So the different light wavelengths uh, come in a buffet of varieties, uh, which we call the electromagnetic spectrum. You see it pictured here, the lower energy light um, being radio waves and the higher energy light being things like gamma rays. And you can see the wavelength difference of radio waves, which are very far apart versus gamma rays, which are, and by very far apart with radio waves, I mean like the size of buildings or the size of human beings, like uh, that's the width of these light waves. Um, waves versus the width of waves of gamma rays are like at the atomic nuclei level. So obviously the higher energy waves, the, the peak wavelength is coming in at a very much faster rate in a gamma ray and therefore it's uh, very high energy and very damaging to us actually. Gamma ray radiation, x-ray radiation, ultraviolet, all damaging to life uh, as we know it. The visible part of the spectrum is kind of the middle part of the spectrum, and then the lower energy being infrared, microwave, and, and radio. Our sun, as it goes through nuclear fusion in its core, produces wavelengths in all the parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. You can see the sun pictured here in radio waves on the far left here, infrared, visible light, ultraviolet, and x-ray. Of course, the ultraviolet and X-ray, these are th and infrared, these are things that we would actually have to observe from orbit. Uh, our atmosphere actually filters out a lot of that light, uh, and that's we're thankful for that actually, because if you look at this, um, the higher energy light is pictured here on the left of this graph, and the lower on the right, um, which is converse to what we've seen so far. But you can see zero percent reaching the ground versus a hundred percent reaching the ground. And thankfully, gamma rays, X-rays, and ultraviolet are mostly all absorbed by the atmospheric molecules, the nitrogens, the oxygens, the ozones, et cetera. Uh, visible light, a small band there, actually reaches the surface. In fact, our atmosphere is transparent to visible light. Our atmosphere also allows many forms of infrared radiation around and through, and also radio waves. 
So all that stuff is lower in energy and, and fine, but um, uh, the uh, higher energy stuff gets absorbed, uh, thankfully. Um, in addition, um, the visible part of the spectrum, uh, if you look at that specifically, the red light uh, is the at the lower end of the spectrum, closer to the infrared side, and the blue light and violet light um, ultimately is is toward the higher end of the uh, visible spectrum. So uh, ultraviolet, um, of course, is harmful. So you kind of think of that as higher energy. Um, so blue hot is hotter than red hot. So get your puns straight. Uh, hotter than blue blazes is definitely hotter than red hot. All right. Uh, also of note, uh, because visible light is the main source of information for the environment around us, our bodies have developed organs that are able to detect information in the visible part of the spectrum. And to me, this is very amazing. This is just really, really uh, cool that um, our biology has recognized the information in our, in our environment around us and has been able to learn how to um, uh, interpret it. So that's really neat. So you have a electromagnetic de radiation detectors built into your heads, and those would be your eyes. One last part of the whole story on light here today is the Doppler effect. The Doppler effect is basically the scrunching or stretching of light waves due to motion. So in this picture here, you see this object S1, S2, uh, each position as it moves prop and propagates to the left here, it emits light waves. And as it moves towards this observer here on the left, uh, the light waves that are being emitted are scrunched together due to the motion. And so if you think about the visible part of the spectrum, if waves are scrunched together, they're going to be more towards the blue part of the spectrum. We call this blue shifting. Likewise, when an uh, object is moving away from a person, as it emits its light, the light waves are actually stretched out uh, more than they should be. And so the, uh, the light looks a little bit redder than it should. The, the lengthening of the light waves takes the light towards the red part of the spectrum. So we call this red shifting. Um, so interesting little side notes that when we look out at the, the um, galaxy around us, we see a lot of the stars red shifting and blue shifting and galaxies mostly red shifting away from us. Some of them actually, like uh, for example, the Andromeda would be blue, sh blue shifting or moving toward us. Um, so this actually helps detect motion, this Doppler effect, very useful. You can actually... Um, see the Doppler effect illustrated in like a police siren or a, a fire engine siren or a train whistle. Um, as you hear the train or fire engine or ambulance coming towards you, uh, the siren is higher pitched. And when the, uh, the ambulance or fire truck or train passes by you, the pitch gets lower as the, the uh, the object moves away. Uh, so sound actually does operate in waves just like light does, but the sound of course is uh, bouncing uh, through the, um, sound waves travel by bouncing through the air molecules versus light which just propagates through the, um, through the um, atmosphere without um, any kind of inter interaction with the uh, molecules. Refraction and reflection are two important principles in light that we carry over from light into telescopes. Refraction, of course, is the bending of light and reflection, the bouncing of light. So let's take a look at each. Refraction is the bending of light. It's where light changes speed and direction when it enters a, a medium that has a different density. My example pictured in the upper right has you looking at the fish here. The fish is emitting light energy and the light wavelengths that are hitting uh, are traveling through the water are traveling at a certain speed. And when they hit the air, the light waves actually speed up. The air is less dense than the water. And so the light waves change direction as they change speed. And so what it looks like is the fish is actually, we are seeing the fish a little bit higher than it actually is. Now, if you're ever stranded on a deserted island and you're gonna survive on spearing fish, you better remember this, that light bends when it trans transforms from one medium to another. This is refraction. An analogy would be like a marching band here, pictured in the, uh, in the right middle. 
as the marchers hit the mud, they slow way down. And so you got this line, the marching band line is bent or crooked because of this uh, interface between the slower moving mud and the faster moving dry land. We use the principle of refraction in telescopes. The outward curving mirror of refracting telescopes or convex mirrors basically take the light and because of the change in speed of the light when it enters and exits the, the lens, the light is directed down and concentrated into one point. It's bounced off that secondary mirror and, and then uh, magnified by the eyepiece. And this is how a refracting telescope works. Light is bent as it passes through the convex objective lens. And therefore, it can be focused into one point for us to magnify and see better. One little commercial here, a little side note. Telescopes are like light buckets. They actually take your small little pupils in your eyes and increase their increase their light gathering power by uh, many, many times. So if you think about this refracting telescope that we have pictured here, what it's doing is it's taking in light from a celestial object and it's gathering light at this size. Imagine your eye being, uh, your eye pupil being just almost like a little point up here. It's making and taking that pupil and expanding it out to this size. So uh, you can look at a dark a section of space and, and notice that in that dark section of space, uh, you don't see anything. But when you look at that same dark section of space with a telescope, all of a sudden you can see little dots there. Now, this is because there's greater light gathering power. So this is why they call telescopes light buckets. And this is the principle of refraction, the bending of light. We also use the principle of reflection in telescopes. This is the bouncing of light. And the incoming light, they call that the angle of incidence, when it hits the reflective surface, it bounces off in an exactly perpendicular direction. And that's called the angle of reflection. And they're equal to one another. Uh, we all know this instinctively. When we look at a, ourselves in a mirror, we have to get completely perpendicular with the mirror in order to see our image, right? Um, so we know this instinctively, but this is kind of the definition of it. The angle of incidence is, ref is perpendicular to the angle of reflection. And surfaces can be more or less reflective. Uh, the reflectivity can go anywhere from zero to 100%. Obviously, like, um, I don't know, a t the desk I'm sitting at here now is not very reflective. I can't see my reflection, but I can see the light reflecting off of it. So it's got... Um, a very, very low percentage, but it still has a reflectivity versus a mirror is closer to 100% in its reflectivity, right? They actually use mirrors in reflecting telescopes. In fact, the objective lens is actually a big mirror. And instead of being convex, this time it's concave. It's inward uh, curving. It's an inward curving mirror. And so what that does is it takes all the gathered light and bounces it with um, the curved mirror into a single ear, a singular point uh, at that secondary mirror that bounces it up to the eyepiece where it gets magnified and you see it. Um, I mentioned in the last slide that ref refracting telescopes are concave or convex, excuse me. It's really hard to machine a mirror properly to get it to work in a con vex sort of way. And so you can't really get bit very big convex mirrors. You can't get really big refracting telescopes as a result. Um, but reflecting telescopes, you can make and manipulate mirrors pretty easily uh, to uh, make them uh, better concave. Uh, uh, concavity is easier to, to machine than convexity. And so as a result, uh, these reflecting telescopes are a lot more, you can get a bigger right? You can get uh, more for your money, uh, I guess. A uh, good reflecting telescope, uh, like a six inch variety can cost you about 500 bucks. Um, and you can actually see the bands on Jupiter and Jupiter's Galilean moons. And you can see uh, the rings of Saturn and you can even see the ice caps on Mars and so forth. So uh, with a good reflecting telescope, you can get a good six inch reflector. With the same amount of money, you can only get about half that size with the refracting telescope because it's so difficult to, to uh, you know, produce. Back in the day, when telescopes were first invented, they were typically refracting telescopes. Uh, 
Galileo used a refracting telescope in order to look at the universe and do all of his uh, make all of his discoveries. Nowadays, reflecting telescopes are used more widely. If you re apply the refraction and reflection we just discussed into telescopes, here's what you get. Uh, the refracting telescope looks something like what you see pictured in, in the right, top right there. Again, you can get a pretty small, compact um, sort of uh, uh, design with this. So it makes refractors ideal for taking out on like a hike or something. Um, you can get as long as you have a nice stable base here. Um, with the reflecting telescope, though, you have a reflecting telescope. Um, they're usually bigger and bulkier, uh, but they provide uh, much larger um, light buckets, I guess. Um, and so these are uh, can be relatively inexpensive for a, a larger objective. And then you can, if you spend a little bit more money, you can get what they call a Cassegrain design. And this actually takes the light in and bounces it off like a normal reflector, but it adds a extra mirror in there. And that secondary mirror brings it up to the eyepiece mirror, uh, which shortens the tube design and makes it a little bit more portable. Uh, but again, this is a little bit more costly because it's a more sophisticated, it's, um, um, you know, a little bit more expensive. All right, we use these principles, primarily reflection, when we deal with uh, observatories on the Earth's surface. And of course, observatories are places where you go to observe things in the heavens with a specialized or larger telescope. Uh, most Earth-based observatories then are gonna be visible light telescopes or radio wave telescopes. Um, Here's the replay of that um, graph I showed you earlier, where it's really only visible light and radio waves that reach through our atmosphere. Uh, so those are the observatories we have on the surface. It's also best to go where you have not a lot of light because light will bounce off the atmospheric molecules and wash out your images. Uh, you also want to go somewhere that's high and dry. Uh, the dryness, of course, is the, you remove the water vapor from the atmosphere. You have less for the light to bounce around on. And high up in the atmosphere, of course, there's less molecules because you're simply above all the molecules that are being drawn towards the Earth's surface by gravity. Uh, some examples of optical observatories include Mount Wilson and Mount Palomar in California. Uh, Mount, uh, they have observatories in Russia and other places in Europe. Uh, the Keck Telescope in Hawaii is one, another one in the U.S. here. Um, and you can actually get pretty big mirrors, as I said, with some of these telescopes. Here's a picture of the Keck mirror. Uh, however, um, you can actually take uh, several different telescopes and point them all at the same thing. And if you combine their images uh, digitally, uh, then you get what's called an array. Uh, an array is use of telescopes in conjunction with one another. Uh, and this actually provides better resolution on images. Uh, the overwhelmingly large telescope is another uh, uh, array of telescopes that they're constructing. Um, again, these very large telescope and overwhelmingly large telescopes, these are uh, way, this is the humor of astronomers, uh, but nonetheless, this is what they've named them, so. Uh, some famous public observatories, Kitt Peak in Arizona, you can go there uh, in Tucson and go up to uh, the mount where it is and uh, you can uh, view there. Sometimes they have public viewings. Uh, Mauna Kea Observatory in Hawaii, you can go tour that, but typically it's uh, reserved years in advance by uh, scientists that, who are working on particular different things because um, it's a very valuable observatory. It's very, it's above the cloud line, uh, so it's high and dry and it's isolated from the lights um, uh, because it's one of the darkest places on earth because it's in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. So uh, it's a very good observatory. And then if you want to observe uh, things in the southern hemisphere that you can't see from the north, you would go to the northern uh, uh, mountains of Chile and they're high in the Andes in the in the desert mountains. You can get uh, some really good images. Uh, the European obser Southern Observatory is there, and there's another Inter-American Observatory there. 
Another type of telescope you can have is the radio telescope. Uh, the largest single dish radio telescope in the world is the Arecibo telescope in Puerto Rico, pictured here. It's 305 meters across. But believe it or not, that actually doesn't give you very good resolution. They also use arrays with radio telescopes. This is the very large array in New Mexico. And what they do is they point these little single dish teles radio telescopes at the same object, and it makes the whole telescope this big because all the images are linked together. Um, they also do this for telescopes all the way across the northern hemisphere. Um, in the United States and our territories, Hawaii, from Hawaii to New Hampshire, from Washington State to the Virgin Islands, they point radio telescopes all at the same thing. And this is called a very la large baseline array. And when they coordinate these telescopes, they get very, very good uh, resolution. They can see details on things far, far away. And so this reaches deeper out into space to read these radio telescope, uh, radio signals uh, from space uh, that uh, many sorts of astronomical phenomenon produce. Um, so this term here, radio interferometry, it refers to using a series of radio telescopes put together to produce a combined signal at, so you can get better resolution. This is called radio interferometry. That's a quiz term you might need to know. If you're observing things other than vis visible light or radio waves, you need to go into space. And so there are space telescopes out there that are free of the atmospheric effects. Uh, of course, the most famous is the Hubble telescope launched in 1990. It has been giving us unprecedented image, uh, images of the universe in the visible light, but also in infrared and ultraviolet for almost 30 years. And the James Webb Space Telescope is set to replace the Hubble. It's pictured here. Uh, that's set to go up uh, on October 31st of 2021 here. And the Spitzer Space Telescope was launched in 2003. That's pictured here. It's giving images in infrared. It's searching some of that those nebulae out there for uh, protostars and things of the like. We also have an X-ray observatory called the Chandra X-ray Observatory that was launched in 1999 and the Integral in 2002. Uh, giving us X-ray images, hotter and more energetic things in space emit these. And the most energetic things are cosmic ray emissions, things like supernova explosions uh, producing gamma ray bursts. This is what the Swift Cosmic Ray Observatory detects. Uh, this one was launched in 2004. You see pictured here an image from the Swift. Uh, this is a gamma ray burst from a zone in space that scientists think are about 13 billion light years away. So uh, in order for that amount of energy uh, to get to us, uh, it would have to travel 13 billion years to get to us, essentially. Um, so if you're producing, you know, an amount of energy that's traveling 13 billion years, then you must be pretty darn energetic. Um, and this is some of the most cataclysmic stuff going on in the universe to produce stuff like this. So that's a look at light uh, from the nature of light and its wave form and its electromagnetic form uh, where we can split the li light waves up we're using spectroscopy and, and studying studying the different life wa wavelengths. We noted the electromagnetic spectrum and how we go from radio waves all the way up to visible light and then from visible light all the way up to gamma rays uh, on that spectrum. And those are common in the uh, production of stars in the core of a star. We noted the visible spectrum has red light, uh, which is lower in energy than blue light, which is going to become important when we talk about stars. The Doppler effect is the scrunching or blue shifting of light when you're moving towards something, or the stretching or red shifting of light as you move as something moves away from you. Refraction of bending of light, reflection is bouncing of light, which we use in telescopes. And then we looked at the different observatories, the visible light and radio wave telescopes and the arrays. And we also looked at our space telescopes. So this is a good look at light and telescopes.